Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, and all of you are welcome to my new broadcasting of Be Committed, and now we are in the book of Esther. Today we're going to talk about in our study, The Mask Comes Off. This is your pastor, Yeti. We are now in Esther 7, in which Haman comes to the end of his rope. When they arrived at Esther's palace apartment, neither the king nor Haman knew that Esther was a Jewess. Haman was probably still distressed because of the events of the day, but he composed himself and hoped to enjoy the banquet. This is the seventh banquet recorded in the book of Esther. Had he known the nationality of the queen, Haman would have either run for his life or falling on his face and beg the king of mercy. God had warned Haman through circumstances, through his advisors and through his wife, but the prime minister would not heed the warnings. The Lord detested all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. God's long-suffering led Haman into the thinking he was saved. Safe, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to the evil. God's long suffering today is an opportunity for people to repent, but our sinful world thinks it means God won't judge sinners at all. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. First, the queen's request. You can read that in the chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. Ever since the previous evening, evening banquets, exorcists had been waiting to hear the queen's petition. So, when the wine was served, he broached the subject. Of course, the statements even to half of the kingdom was a royal promise that wasn't to be taken literally. It simply meant that the king would be generous, and therefore tell him what you want. During the previous 24 hours, Esther had probably rehearsed his speech many times, and now God gave her the strength to deliver. Remember, she was taking her life into her hands, for if the king rejected her plea, that was the end. She made it clear from the beginning that she depended on the favor of the king and wasn't trying to tell him what to do. She also said that her desire wasn't to please herself but to please of the king. This was good psychology, especially when dealing with a chauvinistic monarch like Exorcist. It was also wise on her part not to say, there's a man in your kingdom who plans to destroy all of the Jews. She focused her petition on the fact that the queen's life was in danger and that the king had to do something about it. We have reason to believe Exorcus still beloved his queen and didn't want any harm to come to her, as he sat there in the presence and beheld her beauty. Her words moved him. What monster would want to kill the queen? And not only was the queen's life in danger, but her people were also in danger of being slain. My guess is that this statement perplexed the king. Who were her people? Wasn't she a Persian? Has she been keeping a secret from me? It was then that Esther reminded the king of the degree he had approved to wipe out the Jewish nation. In fact, her words are almost verbatim from the decree. Exorcus was smart enough to put two and two together and understand that Queen Esther was a Jewish, and he had unwittingly consented to her murder. Esther continued by pointing out that the king had been paid to issue this decree. If he had sold the Jews as slaves, such a payment might have been just. But to sell them into that and total destruction was something for which nobody had enough money. 
If it were only a matter of going into bondage, said Esther, I would have kept quiet. Why bother the king with that? But wholesale murder is something I can't ignore. Queen Esther bravely intercedes for her people. How will the king respond? Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. The Lord works out everything for his own ends, and the wicked for a day of disaster. Second, the king's rage. At this point, try to imagine what was going through the mind of King Exorcus. Without openly accusing him, Esther has implicated the king in a horrible crime, and he was bound to feel guilty. The king knew that he had impetuously approved the decree, but he didn't realize that the decree was part of a conspiracy. He had signed a death warrant for his own wife. The king had to find a way to save his wife and save fact at the same time. In an absolute monarchy, the king is looked upon as a god and can do no wrong. This is why ancient monarchs always had a stable of scapegoats available. People who, uh, people who could take the blame for the ignorance or inefficiency of the throne. Modern politicians often do the same thing, and therefore the king questions in five imply much more than who is guilty. The king was also looking for somebody to punish. Axelsus has already received one surprise when he learned the nationality of his queen, and now he would be hit with another. His favorite officer was the adversary, an enemy who had plotted the, the whole thing. Esther didn't reveal that Haman liked the king. I just learned from her own lips that she was a Jewish. Perhaps Exorcist concluded that Haman's crime was wanting to slay the queen and that he had decided to accomplish it by killing all the Jews. For that matter, maybe Haman was part of the Bechton Terish conspiracy that Mordecai had exposed a conspiracy to murder the king. Now we can better understand why God directed Esther to delay her plea. He wanted to give Exorcist opportunity to learn what Mordecai had done, that Mordecai was a Jew and that he deserved to be honored. If a Jew has saved the king's life, why should the king exterminate the Jews? The king got up in a rage left his wine and went out into the palace garden. We've already noted that Exorcist was a man with a short temper, but on this occasion his anger must have been volcanic. His masculine pride was hurt because he had misjudged the character of Amman. He had made a fool of himself by promoting Amman and by giving him such much influence. The king had also erred in approving the decree without first weighing all the facts. As a result, he had endangered the lives of two very special Jews, Mordecai, who had saved his life, and Esther, his beloved wife. No doubt the king walked to and fro uh, sorry, no doubt the king walked to and fro in the garden, doing his best to control the anger that dwelled up with him within him. The wrath of a king is as messenger of death. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion. No wonder Haman was afraid. He had been near enough to the king to recognize and interp interpreted his every mood. He knew the king was about to become judge and jury and pass a sentence from which there was no escape. But for Haman there was one remote possibility, the mercy of the queen. Perhaps he could arouse her pity and get her to intercede for him. As the new Haman was a tool of the devil, determined to destroy the Jewish people. Had he known originally that Esther was a Jewish, Haman might have cleverly worded the decree so that her life would be preserved. But he would still have had authority to annihilate all of her people. 
It was Haman's hatred for the queen's cousin Mordecai that started the whole conspiracy. And Esther wasn't about the abandon the one man who had meant so much to her. In the Sonsino Jewish commentary on Esther, Dr. S. Goldman made the stelling statement about chapter 7, verse 8, the arrogant bully became, as usually in the face of disaster, a winning coward. The five Migulet, 228. When the authority of the king had been behind him, a man could courageously strut about, demand respect, and give orders. But now that the anger of the king was against him, a man's true character was revealed. He was not a giant. He was only a midget, full of pride and had hot air. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Haman's life back together again. What a paradox! Haman had been furious because a Jewish man wouldn't bow down to him. And now Haman was prostrate before a Jewish woman, begging for her life. When the king entered the room and saw the scene, he accused Haman of trying to molest the queen. In his anger, the king would have exaggerated anything Haman did. And beside that, molesting the queen was a capital crime. Forget about the conspiracy. Everybody could see for himself that Haman was guilty of attacking the queen. For that crime alone, he deserved to die. Deserved to die. After escorting Mordecai around the city, Haman had covered his head in humiliation. But now the king's guards covered Haman's face in preparation for his execution. Had Haman covered his head in true humility and repentance, things would have been different. But he refused to listen to the warnings of the Lord. He was so controlled by pride and malice that he was blind to the dangers that lay ahead. 3. Haman's Reward the righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. The, the, the conspicuous gallows that Haman had constructed for Mordecai was convenient for the execution of Haman, and therefore the king used it. Apparently Haman had let it be known in the palace that he planned to kill Mordecai, for the king's servant knew the purpose of the gallows. In his pride, Haman had boasted too much, and his words came back not only to haunt him, but also to help slay him. The day before Haman had led Mordecai through the streets dressed in royal splendor, but now Haman was led through the streets with a covered over his face, and a gallows at the end of the journey. Certainly Haman's wife, Zeresh, and their ten sons witnessed the execution, and did many of the Jews in the city. It must have given courage to the Jews to know that their enemy Haman was no longer on the scene. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked, warned Paul. A man reaps what he sows. Haman sowed against anger against Mordecai, and he reaped anger for the king. Haman wanted to kill Mordecai and the Jews, and the king killed Haman. Even as I have seen, They that plot iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. He who sows wickedness reaps trouble. This unchanging principle of sowing and reaping is illustrated throughout the Bible, and it applies to both believers and unbelievers. Jacob killed an animal and led to his father, pretending to be Esau. And years later, Jacob's son killed an animal and led to him, pretending that Joseph was dead. Pharaohs gave orders to drown the Jewish baby boys, and one day his army was drowned in the Red Sea. David secretly took his neighbor's wife and committed adultery, and David's own son Absalom took his father's concubines and openly committed adultery with them. Furthermore, David's daughter Tamar was raped by her half-brother Amnon. David killed Bathsheba's husband, and three of David's sons were slain. Saul of Tarsus 
encouraged the stoning of Stephen, or Stephen, and when he became Paul the missionary, he was stoned at Lystra. But let's keep in mind that this law of sowing and reaping also applies to doing what is good and right. If we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we reap life everlasting. No good deed done for the glory of Jesus Christ will ever be forgotten before God. No loving word spoken in Jesus' name will ever be wasted. If we don't see the harvest in this life, we'll see it when we stand before the Lord. Even a cup of cold water given in the name of Christ will have his just reward. Haman was hanged or impaled on his own gallows and his body taken down and buried. All of Haman's wealth and glory couldn't rescue him from that, nor could he take away of it with him. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can be any means redeemed his brother, nor giving to a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. Not only is there a personal lesson here, but there is also a lesson about the nation of Israel. Every enemy that has ever tried to destroy Israel has been destroyed. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. It's God's promises to Israel, and he always kept it. God takes his promises seriously, even if the nations of the world ignore them or challenge them. It doesn't mean that God necessarily approves everything Israel has done or will do, but it does mean that God doesn't approve of those who try to destroy His chosen people. My beautiful people, this is a very, very hard and strong story. We see what happened in the life of Haman. This conspiracy. My beautiful ones, we have to look in our own heart. God gave himself in his son to save this world and we have a mission to love one another to live in the truth walk by faith and trusting the Lord blessings to all of you my dear ones this is your pastor Yeti I love you guys bye